we actually helped tenants win the conversion of 59 units uh, in Dorchester and Mattapan into affordable housing. Without our organizing, these 59 families uh, certainly all would have been displaced and, and these buildings would have been converted into luxury housing. Working with an ad hoc planning group on the occupation theme, discussion turned to the many possible ways we might view the idea and the experience of occupation, uh, including questions such as what does it mean to occupy a city or a neighborhood? Who decides who can and cannot occupy a city or a neighborhood? And conversation turned to the work of Boston-based housing rights organization, City Life Vida Urbana. I'm so glad that we're able to hear from City Life's executive director today about the organization's work. And I hope through today's presentation, we may gain insight into how City Life's advocacy work around housing intersects with other historical and contemporary issues for our city. And now I'm pleased to introduce the executive director of City Life, Lisa Owens, who will share the story of City Life's advocacy for housing rights in Boston since 1973. Lisa has served as executive director of City Life Vita Urbana since 2014. Previously an adjunct faculty member at areas, area colleges, she has taught courses on structural racism and US social welfare policy and nonprofit management and leadership. An educator, community builder, and longtime Boston resident, her previous positions include executive director of My Town Inc and program director at the City School, a Dorchester-based nonprofit that trains emerging youth leaders with a passion for social justice. Lisa has a master's of science degree with a concentration in organizational management and leadership. Please join me in welcoming Lisa Owens. Uh, again, my name is Lisa Owens and I'm the executive director of City Life. Um, and today, so City Life, as you'll learn about, is a 45-year-old social justice organization that focuses on anti-displacement and fighting for working class community control of land and housing and fighting for the, for the right to make decisions about the very basic issues that affect working class people's lives. We are known locally and nationally for our commitment to building the leadership of working class people and, we're pr and specifically building the leadership of people of color in the city of Boston. Um, and we are so proud to be uh, celebrating our 45th anniversary on May 19th, um, on Malcolm X's birthday, um, just to sort of culminate this rich, rich history um, that we, of social justice that we are part of. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the social movement context that gave birth to City Life, uh, our early work and accomplishments, and finally, a survey of our organizing methods over the past 45 years. So a little bit about our context. City Life was born in the 70s, um, and we can think of the 70s as a decade of struggle. So, so, what, so there, there were so many single issue and multi-issue um, organizing and social justice movements that were flourishing in the 70s, um, I think it's really, I think it's really interesting to take a look back and to see kind of the breadth of organizing that was happening. So in the 70s, we uh, were in Boston, were uh, right in the middle of, of fights around busing and school desegregation and, um, and responses to the violent attacks against black families and Latino families um, that arose in the middle of those struggles. Uh, there were multiple community support committees to defend racist prosecution of black and Latino families um, re uh, uh, related to uh, trumped up charges because of political organizing and often because of workplace organizing. We had a strong anti-war movement in the 70s. There was a strong prison reform movement. There were workplace fights um, and labor organizing across the city. Um, there was a struggle, this is really interesting, there was a struggle for the rights of undocumented workers in the 70s. Um, and so, I, so as a, just a brief example, in the mid-70s, in the mid -70s, in 75, uh, uh, INS raided Beth Israel uh, Hospital targeting ha Haitian workers. 
Um, and then, and there, and there were a series of workplace raids and individual um, sort of targeting of Haitian activists, which led to um, a major demonstration of solidarity inter among international workers, Haitian, Dominican, Chinese nationals, and U.S. And U.S. workers coming together, linking workplace and and um, and anti-deportation. Um, there were. This was also a time of boycott and divestment movements. So we remember the early movements um, around South Africa, but also here locally, um, uh, organizing in support of workers, the Farm Workers Union, for example. So this was really a rich, rich time in social movement history in Boston. Um, and city life was, was born kind of in the crucible of this struggle. So city life, Vida Urbana, uh, as we can see, originally was called TAG. So we were called JP TAG, the Jamaica Plain Tenants Action Group. Um, and and I'll, in a minute, I'll click through some slides that um, that, that kind of show the breadth of our organizing methods. Um, but what's important to know is that we, we began as an all-volunteer grassroots group of residents uh, in Jamaica Plain, and we organized at that time largely around three issues, tenants' rights, worker and labor rights, and education. Our very first project was the Jamaica Plain Weekly War Bulletin, um, which was published during the height of the Vietnam War. Uh, housing emerged as an, org as an early organizing area. There was an acute shortage of apartments. Uh, so, so really, let's try to paint the picture of what housing looked like in the 70s. So our, our volunteer activists noticed, as they looked around, an acute shortage of apartments worsening building conditions, higher rents, a replacement of homeowners by speculators, urban renewal, gentrification at the expense of working class residents, many of the same issues that, that, have, come, that have circled back around now in 2018. Our volunteer organizers were inspired by the half a, the half a dozen or so um, tenant organizing groups that already existed throughout the city that were, that were using big, bold actions um, to block evictions, to support rent control legislation, and to organize tenants to fight for their power into political activity. So, our, so at City Life, uh, then JP Tag, our goal was to build tenant unions that would be capable of fighting for better housing conditions, uh, mainly through direct action, and, and to build a sense of solidarity among, uh, among people across neighborhoods, across nationalities, through this common, um, this common identity as renters. We campaigned for rent control, we blockaded evictions, we helped form tenant associations, and we even actually helped to start a cooperatively run grocery store in Jamaica Plain. And, and we began to see some, um, some early impressive results. So as a result of our or early organizing in the 70s, we had formed several tenant unions, we uh, were able to uh, defeat some rent increases, we won building repairs, and we stopped evictions. There were three cases in particular that we were very proud of. Um, so, we, so we, along with other allies across the city, um, formed a human blockade, bl putting our bodies in, in front of the doors so the, so the police were not able to evict an elderly woman from her home. Um, we were able to stop the demolition of a building that was um, important to the community, and we were able to intervene in, uh, um, to, to, to uh, stop racist violence uh, against a series of Puerto Rican families by white families. Um, so we really put our bodies on the line, and we were in solidarity with lots and lots of people around the city who were doing the same thing, uh, again, united, uh, through this common identity as tenant and renter. So out of this period came a more sustained focus 
um, in the organization on developing the new leaders that were coming into the movement um, uh, on political education. There was a very strong desire to be rooted in working class identities in the, and in the identities of black and Latinos, particularly Puerto Rican people at the time, um, and being in solidarity with the white um, allies that already were in the organization. So there was a lot of political education. Um, and finally, an emphasis uh, going into the 80s on coalition building, which um, one, one of the major expressions of the coalition building actually culminated in, the, in City, Life's, um, uh, uh, City Life's decision to support Mel King for mayor as the, uh, the first black mayor of Boston. Um, so although Mel King unfortunately didn't win, um, it, really, uh, it, it really helped to kind of um, root City Life's organizing in, um, in uh, multiracial um, uh, progressive coalition or coalition politics uh, at the time. So, so that's, a, that's kind of like a, a brief uh, run through of City Life's early work and accomplishments what I'll do for the next uh, 10 minutes or so is to, is to look, kind of do a retrospective of City Life's organizing methods through the decades. So here you see, um, and, uh, and I'll be using the slideshow for this. So here you see um, one of our earliest pictures of, of our organizing. This is a, a picture of a, a, a young woman holding up a sign that says, uh, Jamaica Plain Tenants Action Group. All right, so our early organizing focused on stopping housing d divestment and neglect. Tenant organizers identified the worst buildings and organized occupants to take power. Soon, thousands of tenants across the city were taking owners to court and even picketing in front of their suburban mansions. In response to this powerful movement, the city passed rent control protections, helping tenants for the next 20 years. In the 1980s, the housing market swung upwards again. Gentrification was on the rise. We helped take occupied buildings, as well as a former school building, which some of us may remember as the Bowditch School in Jamaica Plain. So we help take buildings out of the hands of speculative buyers and create cooperatives and nonprofit affordable housing. We held sit-ins, campouts, vibrant rallies, and we declared Jamaica Plain and other parts of Boston an eviction-free zone. Here is, is a picture of a tent city that was set up uh, to protest the lack of affordable housing. We also allied with the labor movement. We produced two newspapers, the community newspaper and the labor pages. These were key organizing vehicles um, and with a circulation of about 17,000 people at its peak. In the 1990s, the loss of rent control in 1994 sparked a dramatic increase in housing prices. We worked with the Jamaica Plain Community Development Corporation to create affordable housing for elderly and disabled residents, including the Nate Smith House, which is near, now near the current Stony Brook Tea Station. We helped create or preserve close to 1,000 units of affordable housing during this period. We also worked with teen leaders who documented eviction struggles and other social justice issues in a video production project called Vision Crew. In the early 2000s, we focused on helping tenants form associations in their buildings across Boston. In just three years, tenants associations were formed in over 40 buildings. When the housing bubble burst in, tw in 2007, we turned toward the foreclosure crisis and launched the post-foreclosure eviction defense campaign. Our focus became regional and national. We took leadership in forming the National Right to the City Alliance Network and the local Right to the City Boston Network, both coalitions of base building housing justice organizations. We strengthened what we call our sword, shield, and offer method, which combines community organizing, 
mass, mass protest and public pressure on the one hand, with creative legal defense in courts on the other hand, and an entity able to acquire land and housing for permanent affordability. An example of this would be a community land trust. We trained organizers and lawyers across the country on this model. In the, in the, um, from 2010 and up to today, as we know, the housing market is hot again. And Boston is experiencing its largest construction boom. We're fighting for community control of land and housing through our tenant organizing and eviction defense. We continue our anti-foreclosure work and our community land trust work. And now, increasingly, we're fighting, we're supporting community-based fights around planning and zoning and development across the city of Boston. An example of a victory, um, when that is something that happens when we all fight together uh, in coalitions. Um, in 2016, through our organizing and through our partners with community development corporations, with neighborhood associations, and with the city, we actually helped tenants win the conversion of 59 units uh, in Dorchester and Mattapan into affordable housing. Without our organizing, these 59 families uh, certainly all would have been displaced and, and these buildings would have been converted into luxury housing. Um, so we're very, we're very proud of what happens when tenants come together with their residents and with their allies in the city. Currently, we're also campaigning for the Jim Brooks Community Stabilization Act, which will help Boston renters know their rights, help the city collect eviction data, and protect homeowners from eviction post foreclosure. And through a combination of direct action, which, uh, which we call the SWORD, legal defense, which we call the SHIELD, and nonprofit real estate acquisitions, which we call the OFFER, we're taking housing off of the speculative market and converting it into, into permanently affordable housing. All of this is possible because of the work of a handful of volunteer tenant organizers in 1973 who decided that building working class power for social justice, connecting the, the struggles of housing and immigration and labor and international solidarity and women's rights together would ultimately lead to a vibrant movement that was able to create a true systemic change for all residents of the city. Um, so we're very, very proud of the work that we've been able to do and um, we are looking forward to 45 more years of uh, social justice organizing. So thank you very much. I'm curious about the, the concept of, and the term rent control, because you mentioned the, um, um, well, I, I was interested in the, the, the image of the, the little boy holding the sign that uh -huh. says less rent, more control. And yeah. I thought, well, that's so interesting because we think of those two words being one term that, that sort of em embodies the two kind of a combination. So I was just curious how, because I, I feel like I've always like, as long as I can remember, I, I've known that term and I had an idea of what it means and I know about some of the history of sort of how it went away in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. But I don't know is how did that term and how did the, the, the phenomenon of rent control start? Well, I think it's important, I'm going to scroll back to the young boy, less rent, more control. So I think it's interesting to, um, to note that um, this sign, as, as I read it, based on, um, and based on what I know of the organizing that was happening in the 70s, this is both talking about the exorbitant rent increases that people were facing um, and, the, and the horrible uh, building conditions that lots of people were suffering. Remember, this is also around the time when, there, when, when building arson was rampant, um, and it was, very, it was very dangerous, right, to, to live in these, in these buildings. So, so, th so the less rent talks about, I think, is a shorthand for that reality that our people were, were facing. And more control speaks to speaks to our desire for 
um, not just a control of rents, uh, but also a control of land and housing, the ability to, to, to have a say over the day-to-day -day, uh, decisions that, that impact our lives, having a say around planning and development, having a say around whether or not my community deserves a grocery store or five more liquor stores, having a say about, about policy, that, that would redress some of the wrongs um, that, that happened because of redlining, right? So, so, so this Stein, I think, really speaks to a number of those issues as well. It also obviously speaks to the rent control campaign that City Life was part of, um, was one of many, many, many groups uh, uh, around the city fighting for, for regulation of rents to, to kind of speak to um, uh, the, the, the reality that people were facing, which was, you know, uh, uh, deteriorating building conditions and accelerating rents was just untenable for working class people. Following up on that discussion, it seems like the real estate industry is opposing even the most modest things. Jim Brooks is not rent control. It's pretty modest, and yet they're still opposing it mightily. Could you just describe some of your feelings about the, the current moment that we're in? Yeah, so, so, the, so I think we can see a lot of parallels actually between uh, the, the conditions that gave rise to JP Tag in the 70s and the conditions that, that working class renters um, and low income homeowners are facing now. Um, so we're seeing again um, an, acceler an acceleration of rents um, at, uh, and w at the same time that, that our buildings are deteriorating um, speculators are, 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 are taking control of housing um, at t away from low, low income homeowners, right? And, um, and sort of uh, creating a condition where nobody can afford to live in the city anymore. Um, and that's leading to not just rampant speculation, but also a massive displacement crisis. And the crisis, um, although, although we feel it weekly, as more and more people come through our doors seeking, um, seeking help from, uh, from evictions and exorbitant rent increases, the city actually does not have a way to track the crisis that we're currently in and that we have been in. And so City Life, um, along with 40 different organizations across the city, including lots of, of neighborhood groups, um, have petitioned the, the ha, have a home rule petition that we call the Jim Brooks Community Stabilization Act. That act would do, um, as you were saying, very modest things. It gives the city an, a way to, to track the, the, the evictions that are happening across the city so that they can have real data to, to create policy and programs to address the displacement crisis. That, excuse me, that very modest piece of legislation has been, um, we, we have faced tremendous opposition from the real estate industry um, and, and by the people who, who are in uh, elected office who unfortunately are beholden to the real estate industry. Um, and and you, know, you might ask yourself, well, what, what could people possibly have against tenants knowing their rights and the, and, and the city being able to have some data um, uh, by which they can create um, better policy and more, and more sound programming. And really, you know, the, the opposition has been, um, you know, filled with, you know, lots of things that, that Jim Brooks isn't. You know, this is not rent control. This is not um, an evil plot to overthrow capitalism. This is, this is an opportunity for the city to get some really good data. Um, so, but, but we are seeing that the real estate industry is very, very scared and is pushing really hard against this modest piece of legislation. Um, and I just think that that speaks to the power of our movement um, and, and it speaks to the importance for, for us to really build, build upon the solidarity that we've been, that we've been um, um, having a lot of success with every time a building wins a negotiation with their landlord to have a fair rent increase and to, and to get their building conditions taken care of. That inspires a building across the city and that inspires a building in another neighborhood across the city. That builds solidarity and that solidarity builds power. So, 
so I am taking heart. I know that this opposition means that we are strong and we need to get stronger. Um, so it just gives me motivation to continue fighting to organize tenants. Um, so I feel like a lot of what you spoke to is you know, reoccurring themes over and over again, the same kind of struggles every couple decades or so. How in recent years have you guys, or have you felt the need to kind of modernize the approach that you guys are taking with influences from maybe social media or just how news gets spread? Have you guys felt that at all or felt the need to change for that? Yeah, that's a really great question. I think at the, at the, core, the core of what we do um, never changes. You know, we organize working class tenants and, and homeowners in the city to be able to stay in their homes, to work together, to support each other, and to, and to change policy, right? So that we don't have to keep going building by building by building or issue by issue, right? Um, and as, as we are exposed to more tools that, are, that, that enable us to reach more people, like social media, you know, we really try to learn. Um, so an example of this is uh, about four years ago, we hired um, a social media and communications person that has been able to um, create a, you know, a small following. So we have about 5,000 people across the greater Boston area that follow our work. Um, and that are and, and of those 5,000 people, you know, somewhere between two and 300 people uh, consistently come out when we do actions. Um, this group of people also, you know, have made themselves available as volunteers. Um, so we've got a really great network of people that I think have come out of both the door knocking and the social media. Um, who then train themselves to be canvassers. So we have more people knocking on doors. We have more people who are able to lead the, tenant, the weekly tenant meetings. We have more people who are donors who are giving to the organization. And we have more people who are sharing this information um, about, about your rights and how to fight um, within their own social networks. So, you know, we are still young at this. We're still a baby, but we are, we are seeing some modest success. Thank you for the question. Yeah. After 45 years in a fight, how, how does city life keep folks coming in or when uh, do they charge those folks? How, how do they keep that message going on after all these years? Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. How do we keep people coming through the doors? Um, so as I mentioned, we have a really great team of volunteer tenant organizers who knock on doors across the city. So if, the, so if we get wind that there's a building that, um, that may be experiencing a building clear out where everyone's getting an eviction notice, or a building has been bought by an investor or a speculator who has a known history of doing that, we will deploy our, our folks across the city and do a lot of door knocking. Um, social media is another, is another way that people hear. Word of mouth in general is, is the way that people hear about, um, you know, someone, maybe my cousin, came to City Life and was able to negotiate a fair rent increase, and now she, she tells her cousin or she tells her friend, right? Um, but then once people hear about us, what, what they, uh, the next step is to come to a weekly tenant organizing meeting. So what I think has kind of set City Life apart from lots of organizations that unfortunately weren't able to sustain their work over time is that we have regular consistent meetings. So everybody knows that every Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. at 284 Amory Street, there will be a, a weekly tenants' rights meeting where you get to learn about your rights, where you get to speak to a lawyer, where you get to hear what else is happening across the city in terms of housing, how you can get involved, how you can volunteer. Um, everybody knows rain, shine, sleet, holiday, we are meeting. Um, and, and that kind of consistency builds a loyalty over time. Um, and it also, it also creates a space for other groups that are not housing, but are immigration, or labor, or women's rights, uh, to come and also you know, educate our members about what's happening. Um, so our consistency, I think, is what has helped us stand the test of time. Mm -hmm.